All right, folks, hopefully this is gonna work this time. So we're back working on this painting. I've shot two videos since the first one. You've only gotten to see the first. Second video, for whatever reason, YouTube just won't load it. It just ain't gonna happen. Maybe this one will. The second one was my camera's fault. It decided that it was gonna sh shoot slow-mo and I figured you don't wanna watch 20 hours of slow motion painting without any commentary. So I deleted that one. So obviously I've gotten a lot done on the painting now. Some of the areas I've already overpainted, which I showed before. Um, this crease is not disappearing as much as I had hoped, but it is what it is. So now I'm just gonna sort of continue to work on developing these areas. As you can see, I've got a few unpainted areas, decision or two to make yet. But the painting's really come along. I want to work back into some of these areas to pop up. And that's one of the first things. So see how this is like a white on white? This helmet is much brighter. It's, it's layers of color. So I'm actually going to take one of my warm whites and just work back over this existing white and see how much brighter that is. I'll also probably come back into the orange a little bit and give that a little more intensity so that it equals some the value of this orange. But now, I don't want that a pure white, so I'm going to give it a little bit of yellow because that's a highlight area. So one of the things, like my source material, I, the sketches showed the light source, but you always need to think about your light source. Where is your light coming from? How is the painting being lit? Because cast shadows can be very helpful in animating your picture plane. One of my favorite painters, Wayne Tebow, really used shadows to his advantage in creating his works. that really became a big part and all artists intentionally and unintentionally imitate other artists and sort of help find your own vocabulary by accessing the vocabulary of other artists as you develop your own work. So see I just, while I had this white in my hand, I was going to get a little more highlight on this side of the helmet, hard hat, a little bit more of the brim. And then a lighter pressure to fade that into the existing blue, and maybe a little finger drag too, just to smooth it out. Yeah, and speaking to that, I want to soften that edge. And that one. So, so as you can see, this painting has kind of developed blues and greens and an orange. So, if you know your color wheel, So, blue is the complement of orange, red is the complement of green, but since I've got this blue-green, if I use a red-orange, I've got a split complementary scheme, so not direct across the color wheel, but imagine an isosceles triangle, a long, narrow triangle, one point, the apex of the triangle being on the red orange and then the split being on the blue and green the two the base of the triangle the two points of the base uh, you know i've said in the past i was raised by a mathematician so i frequently will deduce things to mathematical vocabulary at the very least but long ago right when the standards of learning tests were starting and I was doing an artist residency in a high school out in Western Virginia. I uh, was asked to give a lecture and there was a big fight about funding for arts education. And one of the points, they said, well, can you, how can you relate that to the standards of learning, particularly the academic standards of learning? And I said, well, 
visual arts, and I would argue also performing arts, is about the only course you'll take in school where all of the disciplines come into play. This was the same group that when I was talking about the paint sticks drying, one of the kids, how they learned was a chemistry uh, science whiz, said, oh, those, they're not drying, they're congealing. And in my lecture, I relayed that point and said, see, you know, so there's chemistry involved in art. There's mathematics, as I was just explaining, involved in art. And then, depending on your work, and certainly if you study art history, you need to understand the history. So you're learning history as you're learning about the art that was made at a particular time. I took a course in college that was taught, co-taught at that time, husband and wife team. He was a history professor and she was an art history professor. And they drew the correlations between what was happening in the visual arts was what was happening in the, his, the history of the era. The, it concentrated on the 20th century and particularly the area between the wars. One of the points uh, that was stressed was the Dada art grew out of the horrors that those who had to fight in the trenches had seen and sort of the whole dehumanization and mechanization and Dada art has a lot to do with that. So the oil sticks, I'm sorry, I was sitting here looking at these. So you've got this orange coming in this one. This was painted over a dark area. And so the oil sticks are translucent. So some of the under color pops up through. And so if you're in a dark area, it takes a fair number of layers to get the same. Well, you probably will never get to it. Ideally, if I wanted it to be this value, I'd have to paint this all white and then paint the color back up over top of it again. And uh, that doesn't strike me as a great idea right now. And so I, um, but also, I, you know, a little bit about the contrast and values and contrast and colors and not everything being the same is important to the painting. So, I thought I'd take a quick look and make sure it was actually recording. Um, so now I'm gonna work on this hand right here because I wanna, there are jeans behind it and I don't wanna get a super hard edge between the two. Um, one of my professors the same professor who told me that the four edges of the paper are the first four lines of your drawing. And on that day hence, I never worked to the edge of the paper because I'll be damned if anybody's going to uh, make my first four drawings. But he talked about in painting, you really don't want a hard edge. You don't want a definitive separation between objects. So there's a little bit of paint bleed and like this area of the detail, I, I'll um, have yet to figure out how to post stills on YouTube. Clearly, I need to do some U-turn learning. If anybody can share me some uh, links to YouTube video making tutorials, I'd be most appreciative things that you like to see, things that have helped you. Because let's face it, we're all here learning from each other. And yes, I'm doing these tutorials, but I'm showing you what I've learned. Now, part of the 
ego thinking I know something because I've been working with these for a long time. I'm 78, so 34 years. So in that 34 years, I've learned a little bit about how to handle them. And a lot of people, including myself when I started, had no idea how to use them. So hopefully these will save you a little trial and error time. Or, like I said about looking at other artists' work, you can see what youth might work for you. And there's every bit as much to learn in looking at something that somebody does and go, well, I'm not going to do that. That's every bit as valuable as looking at something and going, oh, I would love to be able to do that. How did they do that? positive, taking the good, or what you think is the good, and taking what you think is the bad, like, yes, I want to do that, no, I don't want to do that. Those are equally valid, equally important, and equally strong ways to learn how to do something. And then there's the whole, well, you told me to do it that way, so screw that. I'm not going to do it that way. There's also <laughs> very valid emotion in art making. Very useful attitude. I also don't want to make this too long for fear that that's why the other one didn't load. And so also one of the things I'm doing is like you can see how, the, how this paint stick has the white is whiter up there and not as white on the other. Or I hope you can see that. So I'm using some of the there's variations to help create some variation than what I'm painting. So, I feel pretty good about that hand. So now I'm going to work in the jeans underneath. And like I use this alizarin crimson right here at the edge of the shadow side of the hand. And I'm going to lay in some of that for the area of the jeans. And that will help, as I said, blend the two shapes. You won't have a clear, I mean, obviously right now you can see where the hand is and where the jeans are. But if you get up really close on it, and I do intend at the very end of this to give you a, just a video of all the areas of the painting so you can really get a sense, because you're getting this distant view, you're getting the viewer's view but like when I go to a museum, and I hope you do the same, I look at the paintings like this, and then I get yelled at by the guards. Um, I tend to get a little nervous when you get really close to a painting. Not that I would ever, ever think of damaging a work of art. I had a gallery owner once tell me that as soon as a painting is done, an artist should never be allowed to touch it again. Because we oftentimes tend to not handle our work as precious. And again, same professor. His name was Jewett Campbell. Um, so you, as you're creating, particularly when you're creating the work, but generally speaking, you cannot think of the value of your artwork. Um, you can't be sitting here going, well, you know, this is a, well, this, this size in market for about 4200 $4,500. 
and um, I can't be treating this as though it costs that. I can't be thinking about that, and I don't. What he said you need to do is, it is just paper and paint supplies until it's done. And of course, this gallery owner's point was, you know, artists who don't think of them as precious. I mean, I know that I will make another painting and another one after that, and another one after that, until I'm not breathing anymore. And I hope, I intend, at the start of every painting, for it to be the best painting. And so, if the new painting is the best one, the existing painting, therefore, at most, can be the second best one. Now, obviously, that is, that's not the way it plays out. I've done some paintings years ago that are part of me goes, wow, I wish I could paint that, paint like that again, paint that painting again or paint something close to that again. I was really in the zone. I was really, painting was speaking to me that day. And the thing is, the artist, oftentimes, is not the best interpreter of which ones are the good ones. <laughs> Um, a very fortunate one to have a wife who really respects and admires what I do, but also uh, she's also given me amazing and great ideas, including using paint sticks on my art making. But she's also, and this is a really important part, an excellent critic. And I mean critical. And if I was a frail ego, I would say hypercritical. But it's really important to have that voice you trust to say, no, that doesn't work. You know, they can do it nicely. I mean, that's always better. <laughs> but the important point is have somebody you can listen to. Have somebody who can objectively look at your work because we can't. So back to the point of what an artist deciding what the good painting is. My definition of a good painting is a painting where I try something and it doesn't work, but I solve the problem another way and that really works. Or I try something and it works. But the main thing is that I'm I'm always hoping that the work is evolving and that I'm learning something new every time I pick up a paint stick. And I, I don't know if I've said it before in this video, but I know I've said it before in videos. It's the learning, it's the discovery, it's the problem solving that keeps me painting. And so, what did I say, 40, 35 years later, I'm still making discoveries with this media. Still making discoveries on how to build a painting. For example, as I was saying that, I just discovered this strong diagonal line in this painting. So I want to figure out how I can um, get some back against that strong. I mean, there is. There's these vertical arms, too, that are sort of reacting against that strong line. 
So, I say this frequently, all painting is abstract. All painting is not, you know, is abstract art. And I'm just not good at developing, or I, and I'm, for myself, I love abstract work, but for myself, I'm not interested in, in and don't feel I'm good at that non-representational vocabulary. There is the painting vocabulary. There is pushing the images forward. There is these compositional elements and this color and this push and pull and all of that in this painting. This is an abstract painting and it's built as an abstract painting, but I'm hanging it on representation representational imagery i'm hanging it on these construction workers but that's that's because i find that the best way for me and i do mean for me i'm not saying for artists i'm not saying for but that's the best way for me to build a successful painting so while i was thinking that i was looking and I'm seeing one thing I can do is repeat the diagonal lines because if I already have that happening sort of here, this diagonal, the stripes, the reflective bands on the vest, and now we get these helmets and uh, t-shirt. So that necessitates putting this in. And I'm thinking, just as I'm doing this, that I will, um, because I have, I don't need to check, but the intention was a Mexican flag there, even though he looks white. Not to say that Mexican people don't look white. So I think we have the Texas star. So, and of course, if you go to a construction site, you're going to see this a lot. You're going to see American flags on the construction, construction helmets, hard hats. And given the way I work, I mean, there are no fingernails here. So having stars in that image wouldn't be... logical and necessary. Because if you see this, just right now, oh, that's an American flag. It's a symbol. And I'm communicating, so I'm trying to communicate what's happening with the I'm also, I've done something wrong and I've got the wrong number of stripes. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five, six. What is that? That's 11. Yeah. There should be one more red and white. But it isn't. Again, that's not the point here. All right, so again, my website is gregleach.com, where eventually this painting and possibly prints will be available. And there are plenty of others. Plenty of others. <laughs> and then uh, the paint sticks are Shiva, is the brand name. Rich Art is the manufacturer. And I'll put all of these website connections or at least I'll write them. I haven't figured out a hyperlink yet. And hopefully this time this video will actually load. So I apologize that there's so much time between the first and this one, but it is what it is. And hopefully this one, if you're hearing me tell you this, this one worked. If not, I don't know what I'm doing wrong. So thanks for taking the time to look.